Hugh Enoch Powell. Powell wants to retrieve an English tradition where independent patriarchs have their interests represented in an orderly fashion through parliamentary sovereignty. He's looking to recover the original character of Englishness, orderly independence. Powell wants to get rid of all the things that compromise this orderly independence, and he sees empire, commonwealth migration, the national compact between labour and business and the welfare state, he sees all of these as cancers that have grown on the original Englishness. Don't get Powell wrong, he's against empire. He's against empire for English purity. He's like the alt right now. That's what the alt right are. They don't want to take over the world, they want their pure space. Now, all of these empire, Commonwealth migration, the national compact, the welfare state, all of these for power have bred undeserving traits, dependency, idleness, etc., whether internally via universal welfare or externally via the black presence. Powell's anti-immigration stance is therefore congenitally anti-universal welfare and anti-labour and vice versa. You won't understand power unless you understand that those two things are What's the word? Congenital. But now we're in an economic downturn. It's the 1960s. Jobs are threatened. The labour movement is awash with racism. But the Labour Party speaks to the white working class as a class. Alternatively, it's Powell who's speaking to them as the white working class. Then Thatcher takes over and channels Powell. So it's not that the white working class vote for Thatcher in 1979 in order to get rid of welfare and a compact between state, labour and business. They don't. They vote for Thatcher to protect the whiteness that they have relatively benefited from as part of the national compact. It's their whiteness, don't forget, that has made them more deserving than others, not their class. Thatcher tragically, embarks upon an intentional process of deindustrialization, and she breaks up the national compact with the unions, business and the state. Skilled manual jobs decline rapidly, as does it a bit later the shop steward movement. By the 1990s, the informal colour bar that benefited white workers is broken. And I'm talking about that colour bar which is part of the national compact. That institutionalised informal colour bar is broken. The white working class disintegrate as a, a constituency, they effectively commit suicide. What about the white poor? It will save them in the new neoliberal era. This becomes the mission of New Labour under Tony Blair. In fact, in some ways, New Labour returned welfare policies to the eugenicist days of the late 19th century. The undeserving are now coded by government as problem families and as part of an underclass with no functioning patriarchs. Just think about benefits to you. No orderly independence. Policy-wise, New Labour turns welfare into workfare. Those with undeserving characteristics should be compelled to work rather than simply receive welfare. In doing so, New Labour reinstates the deserving, undeserving distinction of the poorlings. They formally reinstate them, but with one key difference. Unlike the late 19th century, the undeserving poor are now categorically white. Post-colonial British population is now multicultural. This explicitly white underclass becomes a stain on national pride. New travellers come to the estates, the council estates, and self-consciously mimic the writings of late 19th century visitors to the East End. Take, for instance, the book Dark Heart, an expose by Nick Davies of council estates. He begins by considering himself to be like some Victorian explorer penetrating a distant jungle, there to visit sprawling collections of battered old houses, crack houses, and shabins. Think also about the popularity of the term Chav in the 90s and the 2000s. Deriving from the Romany word for a small child, the Chav is associated with marketplaces populated by travellers and South Asian hawkers. In fact, being Chaved comes to refer to being robbed at home and in this respect, as some have pointed out, echoes older contrived fears of being mugged by black youth. 
In fact, it's interesting to place the 2011 up, urban uprisings and riots in this context. Now, there's a specific history of police racism towards the African Caribbean community in Tottenham, which informs the media reaction to the police execution of the black youth Mark Duggan. But it's the disorderly qualities of the undeserving poor that frames the political response. Here's David Cameron. Irresponsibility, selfishness, behaving as if your choices have no consequences. Children without fathers, schools without discipline, reward without effort, crime without punishment, rights without responsibilities, communities without control. There's also another response. In the immediate aftermath, David Starkey, a popular historian of English constitutionalism, gives comment on Newsnight about what seems to him to be the shocking inclusion of white youth amongst black youth in the riots. Explicitly referencing Enoch Powell's fear of race genocide engendered by the black presence, Starkey bemoans the fact that the whites have become the new blacks. In a follow-up news article, Starkey digs deeper on his point. It's the white lumpen proletariat, cruelly known as the Chavs, who have integrated into the pervasive black gangster culture to become as disaffected and as riotous. In other words, Starkey blames the actions of white youth on the transmission of a nihilistic black culture to England's own genetic future. Here, the slave analogy of the 19th century becomes a causal mechanism once more for explaining race degeneration. The 2011 riots confirmed this, that the white undeserving might still be rescued, but black is undeserving in and of itself. And this moral argument, that even if the white underclass are letting the side down, they're still our own. That argument underpins a resurgence of English nationalism, historically imbued with whiteness. The nation will substitute for the loss of class privilege. Whites, unlike blacks, Muslims, East Europeans, whites, even if undeserving, even if benefit cheaters, loafers, bad parents, they're still more deserving than others to be saved. They can't be abjected. The genius of Nigel Farage is to connect the fallout of the industrialization the national embarrassment of a white underclass and a racialised English nationalism he folds all this into a critique of the EU. The powerful appeal of his synthesis is fatally misapprehended by Cameron when in response to pressure from within his own party he provides a national referendum on EU membership. So let me finish with the Brexit vote and I want to show you how it relates to some of the stuff that we've been talking about. First of all, the debates over Brexit in 2016 by and large represented the real, the ordinary, as Theresa May would say, working class as residents of the old industrial, now largely deindustrialized North, and as English and as white, those left behind, residual, left behind by neoliberalism. But the numerical majority who voted Brexit were not from the deindustrialized North nor even from the working class. While more working class voted for Brexit, more middle and elite classes voted Brexit than working class. It's true, though, that even though the southern middle classes were the numerical majority of the Brexit vote, still, in relative terms, the poorer you were, the whiter you were, the older you were, the more likely you were to vote leave. And it's also true that immigration was a key concern of the vote, and you can consider the issue on decision-making, an issue that's directly linked to open borders. In fact, the thing that divides Remainers and Leavers more than anything else is immigration. But, let's be clear, this vote wasn't primarily a critique of the EU or its recent effects. Changes in earnings over the last 15 years, where EU migration really picked up, these changes did not correlate in a vote to leave. But entrenched long-term geographical differences in earnings did correlate. In other words, we have to situate Brexit within deindustrialization 
and its destruction of the white working class. In fact, most Leave voters did not think that EU immigration had actually been bad for their personal lives or the areas where they lived. But they were far more negative about the national impact of immigration. Now, interestingly, recent studies of whiteness in England point to the way in which entitlement to welfare is perceived by poor white communities to be based upon national belonging, actually a right of being English, and not on the idiosyncrasies of their local context. And those who voted leave were far more likely to consider themselves English. So here's my interpretation of all this, based on the histories that we've been talking about. Immigration was held responsible for the loss, under Thatcherism, of those elements of the national compact that had made the white working class a deserving constituency. Once the white benefits of the old national compact became detached from the labour market, all that was left was the legacies of the welfare state to hold on to. And if you were no longer privileged as a working class, you'd fall back on your nationalism, Englishness as the deserving category, meaning Anglo-Saxon, meaning white. Meanwhile, UKIP were busy claiming that the Westminster elite, who were busy sacrificing public provisions on the altar of austerity, were also betraying the forgotten people of England by encouraging even more immigration, albeit from the EU. And it didn't so much matter that these migrants were ostensibly white, what mattered was that they were not white English. And in any case, as UKIP had got you thinking, behind every pole was a Muslim or an African waiting to invade the heartlands. How might we think about Brexit differently, given all that I've presented? Well, let me give you two possibilities, and you might have more. Here's the first one. Britain's division of labour was always imperial. That historically trite fact holds significant consequences for the openings of social justice that some hope might accompany Brexit. Put it like this. The Parliament of Great Britain was formed in 1707 by the Union of England and Scotland, two polities that possess colonies and colonial ambitions. In the succeeding centuries, Parliament governed over not just a national economy, but a vast imperial hinterland of land, labour, raw materials, markets and influence. Later, this hinterland became a commonwealth that effectively state, saved the sterling economy after, post, after World War II. Preempting the effective loss of this hinterland, Prime Minister Ted Heath finally engineered the successful accession of the British economy to the EEC in 1973, and the EU has since functioned for the British economy as a kind of substitute to the hinterlands of empire. Brexit marks the ultimate loss of empire's protective hinterlands. There is, then, a terrible irony to Theresa May's optimistic invocation of a post-EU global Britain. In fact, for the first time ever, Parliament will have to govern over and reckon with a truly national economy. And for the first time, its resident domestic population will have no hinterlands with which to protect itself from the vagaries of the global market. Secondly, public debate since the EU referendum has almost entirely obscured the diverse constituencies of Britain's poor and working poor. It's been as if only the English white residents of northern deindustrialised towns are ordinary, real, working class. In the current political lexicon, black citizens appear only in terms of victims or aggressors in the criminal justice system. Muslim citizens only appear as victims of Islamophobia or suspects of terrorism. It's almost as if it doesn't matter that black and minority ethnic communities, especially their women, have in relative terms been most detrimentally impacted by austerity measures over the last 10 years. That's the stats. Now, the genealogy that I've sketched above reveals that race is fundamental to political economy. 
to issues of capital accumulation, distribution, redistribution, labour, exploitation, inequality. I'm saying class is race. But at present, it's as if race is only allowed to be considered an issue of political discrimination, while economic inequality is a class issue, a far more important issue to which race is safely derivative of. The narrative from 2008 onwards has been this. We fixed that discrimination thing, but we forgot about the real injustice, social inequality. Hence the return of the white working class as deserving of jobs and welfare. But look at the faces of the victims of the fire at Grenfell Town. Black and minority peoples, refugees, women are overrepresented. These are the faces of those killed by an uncaring metropolitan elite living just around the corner in their mendacious pursuit of neoliberalism, gentrification and austerity. Are these not ordinary people? Why don't they represent the popular will? The most meaningful struggles against the system have always come from those on the edge and the outside, those categorised as undeserving. When England's masses became deserving, they were fated as a white working class constituency. And insofar as they accepted and acted upon the terms of that incorporation, then they became insiders to the system. At least they got class benefits then. But it seems that all they have left to reclaim now is their whiteness. And those economic and political interests who are driving Brexit are feeding on that. They're claiming they're representing the popular will of the people against mendacious politicians. They've racialised that popular will. It's a white will. <coughs> Meanwhile, what these Brexiteers really care about is leaving the European Court of Justice so that they can get rid of all remaining regulations regarding workers, consumers, the environment, oh, and housing standards, including fire safety. So to imagine that justice against the system will now be served in the name of the deserving white working class doesn't make sense to me. Reparative justice has to be pursued in the name of the asylum seekers, refugees, Muslims, blacks, and yes, even those sufferers who died in Grenfell fires and who happened to be white. Those who have been demonised as undeserving start there. And blackness, one of the most fundamentally undeserving in the British Empire, idle, promiscuous, anarchical slaves, children who can't control themselves, an infection on England. But you know, at one point, even some of the English poor were blackened. Whiteness is treacherous even to those currently racialised as white. Yet besides empire lies a genealogy of resistance handed down by all those collectively punished as undeserving, but who refuse such a system of racialised classification. This detritus of empire has rarely been considered the material from which to build new publics, and certainly not in the metropolitan core, but the stone which the builders rejected shall become the chief cornerstone. Thanks. Thank you.